start. Good evening, everybody. Welcome. Um, I'm Sigrid Rousing. I'm the editor of Granta. Um, I've been told that they're live streaming, recording and live streaming this event. So when it comes to asking questions, please wait for the microphone, I think, was the message. Um, so we're here to launch this issue of Granta. That is not the territory. Um, I have with me Charles Glass and Janine Di Giovanni. Um, Charles is a broadcaster, journalist, and writer. I have to say, for both of them, I feel I hardly need to introduce them because it seems like they you know simply everybody who's here. So or, only bear our with friends me. would show up. Yes, <laughs> <laughs> bear with me. Um, so Charles is a broadcaster, journalist, and writer who began his journalistic career in 1973 at ABC News at the Beirut Bureau <coughs> and was the chief Middle East correspondent from 1983 to 1993. Since then, he's been a freelance writer and is the author of four books on the Middle East, including the forthcoming Syria Burning. In the Battle of Kas for Kassab, which is the piece in this issue, Charles describes the fate of the last Armenian town in Syria after the Turkish army relinquished control of portions of its border with Syria to units of Islamist rebels in March 2014. He places this event in the wider context of the 1915 Turkish genocide of Armenians and Turkey's continuing denial of those events. Janine De Giovanni is the Middle East editor of Newsweek, a war and conflict reporter for 25 years. She's a member of the Council of, on Foreign Relations and was recently made an Ockberg Fellow at Columbia University for her work on trauma victims. Janine also advises the United Nations Refugee Agency and the Geneva Center for Security Policy. In After Zero Hours, the title of the piece and the issue, she recounts her experiences reporting on Iraq's seemingly endless cycle of conflicts and remembers old friends who have disappeared, emigrated or fled. So Janine, before I ask you to read, can I ask you to say a few words about the piece, uh, just to give us some context before you read? Well, when Sigrid and I first met, um, we're thinking about themes, and the theme that comes to me over and over when I think of Iraq is loss. So as I was writing and as I started reporting, and I think it was four trips um, to do this piece, so I'm very grateful also for Granta for allowing us to do this long format reportage, which as many of you know is disappearing. Thank you for the opportunity to, to do that. Um, I wanted to try to assemble a map of Iraq because I was very fortunate um, before the American invasion in 2000, 2003 to be able to drive across the length and width of Iraq with my minder, who was basically uh, employed by the Ministry of Information. But nonetheless, it was this extraordinary journey. But even as I was doing it, I was very aware that this was probably the last time I would do it in my lifetime and that these places would in one way or another, vanish once the occupation came. So it, it's a very um, personal piece. It, it's my perception. I think it's quite a sad um, And it really is about the, it's very character driven because it's the, my friends, my Iraqi friends who really made this piece what it is. Thank you. Do you want to read? Sure. I can't remember what page it's on. After zero hour. The last days of Iraq, shortly before the collapse of Saddam Hussein's regime, the Ministry of Information, which controlled the movements of all the press, granted my request to travel the country by car. That was in 2002. My companions on these long and melancholy trips, shadowed by the coming American invasion, were my driver Munzar, 
a transplanted Palestinian Sunni whose family had emigrated to Iraq in 1948, and my translator, Reem, who came from Babo province. Sometimes we were accompanied by a bad reminder, graciously provided by the ministry, whose purpose was to spy on us and take detailed notes about where we were going and whom we saw. Occasionally, Ali, another translator, a film scholar who worshipped Martin Scorsese, also came along. But he and Manzar had a tumultuous relationship, which some, sometimes came close to blows, so we tried to keep them separated. Munzer had a 1987 Oldsmobile, like something out of Starsky and Hutch. I loaded up the car with fruit and water, a medical kit, emergency supplies, and we'd begin, driving up and down, north and south, east and west, across the country. I knew then, even as we were traversing the endless Saddam Hussein highways, Baghdad to Basra, Baghdad to Mosul, that I would never, ever take those routes so effortlessly again in my lifetime. With that invasion and the insurgent war that followed, Iraq would virtually disappear. The land of date trees, oasis, and desert would be marked by checkpoints and graves. I did not know then the extent of the anguish that would fall on the beguiling known as the land between two rivers, the Euphrates and the Tigris. But I did know as we drove through those biblical ruins, those languid farming villages, those dusty cities, that they would be closed forever after the bombs started falling. The American invasion was planned and even had a date, but there was little solid information about it. We were cut off from the world on those trips. The internet at Baghdad was carefully controlled. There were no cell phones. I doubled satellite phone, but it was illegal to use it. The Mukabarat, the secret police, watched us so closely that it would have been impossible for me to go outside, find a satellite in the sky, and set it up without being caught. I kept it for emergencies. What will happen when the Americans come, I asked Reem or Ali. In Baghdad, children were digging trenches and sandbags were being piled on street corners. But no one wanted to look too far. Reem usually stayed silent. Once, Munzar answered, we will fight, and that was that. We kept driving. We drove to the sacred Shia cities of Najaf and Karbala. We drove to Saddam's house, hometown of Tikrit. We drove to Babylon and Diyala. We spent Eid, the festive marking of the end of Ramadan, with a farmer who proudly slaughtered a goat in front of us in an alley, a gruesome killing, and then we had lunch. Once, Reem and I went to the Imam Hussein Shram, Shrine in Karbala. Reem went inside and came back with a green ribbon for me. It means, she said solemnly, you get a wish. Reem knew what I wanted. I was getting married in August, and I dropped my head and closed my eyes and wished that I would be happy, that I would be safe, and that I'd have a healthy child. Along the way, on our long days, we met Iraqis from the sects and tribes that make up the extraordinarily diverse ethnicities of the country. We went to stay with the Yazidis, with blue-eyed Assyrians. We met Sunni Arabs, Shia Arabs, Turkmen, Chaldeans, Caesarians, Armenian Iraqis, Iraqi Jews, and Kurds. We knelt with terrified Christians celebrating Mass a few days before Christmas in Mosul, praying for the war to be halted. A few months later, on Ash Wednesday, we sat with some Chaldeans at St. Mary's Church on Palestine Street in Baghdad, which in 2009 would be blown up by a bomb as wor worshippers were leaving Mass. It was surreal to be poised, waiting for the war to start. The city was suddenly invaded with international do-gooders who showed up in a last-ditch attempt to stop the bombing. There were feminists from Code Pink and busloads of hippie protesters who had arrived from Jordan. One night, I came back to my hotel in Baghdad, Hollywood actor Sean Penn wandering around the lobby looking lost. We went to my room and smoked cigarettes. Penn wondered if there was any alcohol. Iraq was dry unless you smuggled it in your own. And he talked about how he had come as an average citizen from California to stop the war. It's up to the Iraqi people to get rid of their own leader, he said which was basically what everyone else except the American, American military planners and George Bush 
was saying too. In a kind of fever in those last days of peacetime, I collected as many names and phone numbers of ordinary Iraqis as I could as a willful verification process. I wanted to go back after the war and find out how many of those people still lived or how their lives had radically changed. I'm almost done. I went to monasteries, universities, libraries, archaeological sites, and hospitals. I listened to the biblical stories of Jonah, who wandered northern Iraq, and the whale of Assyrian kings of Nineveh, city of great sin. I traced maps of Mesopotamia, ancient land that also included parts of what are now Kuwait, Syria, and Turkey. We stopped driving when it got dark and slept in eerie, empty hotels where the Mukhobarat sat in the lobby. Um, there's a bit about spying I'm going to skip. Um, but what I remember best in the haze of memory was going to the place that had come to be known as the mythical hanging gardens of Babylon. Reem and I spent a gloomy day wandering through the gardens, which were disheveled and in disarray, a sad fate for one of the seven wonders of the world, if in fact they really did exist and were not just a poetic creation. There were no green meadows arranged by Nebuchadnezzar for his queen, Amitis, and there was no Tower of Babel in the background. It was empty except for a lone family wandering through the ruins and a darkened gift shop. Saddam often compared himself to Nebuchadnezzar, the Chaldean king. Everyone knows how that story ended, though. He conquered Jerusalem and destroyed the temple. But according to the book of Daniel in the Old Testament, he was also humbled by God for his arrogance. The king went mad, succumbing to bouts of shrieking insanity, and lived in the wild for seven years. Reem was often silent on these trips, sitting in the back seat with her oversized black plastic handbag at her feet. The gardens of Babylon disturbed her. They seemed symbolic of fallen empires and worlds disappearing. Said one more paragraph to the end. She stared out the car window, taking in the endless rows of swaying date trees along the highway. Ali had told me once that the trees represented the soul of the Iraqi people, their profound connection to their country, their sacred land, and their identity. Those dreamy, plentiful trees haunted me after the invasion. The Iraqi soul had been lost. Thank you very much. It's beautifully done. I mean, one could weep for this lost world. Yeah. And does weep. And one does weep. I was wondering, as you were reading, what happened to all those telephone numbers and names that you collected? What happened to all these people? I have them still. And I, I've archived them. And I did go back. Um, Right after, about, I had my son, and then I came back. And um, I tried to look up many of the people. And also what I had done at that time, which was the same thing I had done in Kosovo, was I asked people at the time to try to draw for me maps of mm -hmm. where mass graves would be. Because in the Saddam time, of course, you couldn't investigate where your relatives were. So I really was trying to find the missing and the lost. And I knew that if I got their names down, that I had some kind of documentation. So every time I go back, virtually, um, I have these notebooks with me, and I try to find so some of the people are still there. Most aren't. Many have been killed. Um, we lose people all And I, I felt that if I somehow had documentation of them, mm -hmm. they wouldn't disappear. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And one really horrible thing I remember is a couple of days after Saddam died, uh, died, sorry, no, not his death, when he, was, um, when he fell, the fall of Baghdad, one of Munzer Ali, made up names, by the way. I had to change their names because they still have relatives inside and they're mm -hmm. very frightened, um, went with me. And we went to one of the, the prisons where people were tortured. And one of the things I'll never forget is that there were one man had scratched on the wall in blood. He tried to keep the days. And he said to my family, you know, never, never give up hope. Mm -hmm. So. 
in the days after, and many of us are here who, who reported that, we could freely, finally wander around Saddam's palaces and the torture chambers and went out to um, Abu Ghraib. And, and mm -hmm. I think you were with me, Sam, and we saw the, the, the hanging platform where, yeah. where he hung everyone. And so it was extraordinary because we were living one life that we could see in the Saddam days, but there was an entire parallel universe going on that we had no idea about. And mm -hmm. I just mm -hmm. felt mm -hmm. by collecting those names and trying to archive them, in a sense, mm -hmm. that it would give them some kind of validity. Yes. There's a passage that I'm now thinking about as you're talking, which is very, very sad, where you describe visiting a morgue um, and you see lots of bodies, many with signs of torture, um, of Sunnis who've, who've been killed. Can you talk about that? Yes. Um, unfortunately, I've spent a lot of time around mass graves when they first open them, um, and relatives come out and try to identify their family. And it's horrible because sometimes the last thing they see is maybe a jacket that the person was wearing when they were taken off. And so when they pull what's left out of the grave, they might see the jacket and that's their loved one. Um, this particular case was very recently though, um, which is disturbing because the piece then jumps in time and goes back to June uh, when I was in Baghdad and Mosul fell. June 10th, a whole different, Mosul fell to ISIS, the Islamic Front, um, and I was in Baghdad, and they got within eight miles of the, of the center, and so it, it was getting, people were once again plunged into this kind of terror, but this time an entirely different kind of terror, and I kept going back to Baghdad to see the rise of the Shia militias, who in the whole cycle of vengeance and revenge were now turning on the Sunnis. So this scene that you're talking about was, I was in a morgue and Sunni men were beginning to disappear. And I went to a morgue and I was sitting with a woman who was looking for her brother. And they the way they do it now is they've modernized it. So they flash on the wall and you see the photograph and, and she saw it and she just collapsed because it was her brother that she lived with and he was taken off in the middle of the night and he was a teacher. Um, so, um, mm. <laughs> tragic because it's once again you know this sort of cycle of violence and revenge and killing and death squads mm -hmm. seems to be the endless war yeah I was wondering if you could talk a little bit more about the Yazidi and what happened to them um, I'm sure uh, all of us remember seeing the people being really hunted into the mountains by IS as they were coming in um, Christians and Yazidis, I think, um, and who were then eventually rescued. Have you followed that story? Yes, because I was lucky enough to stay with the Yazidis for about a week in yeah. this, um, <laughs> this, part of the this road trip. Yeah. Um, and they were wonderful people, and it, it sounds, but you know, they let us stay, and I went to a wedding, I went to a funeral. Um, you know, slept, with, slept in their homes, played with their babies, cooked with the women, um, learned about their religion, which was fascinating, about the peacock god and strange things that they can and cannot do. Um, and it seemed to me that, aside from having a lot of Chevrolets around, that they could have been in the 17th century or the 18th century. Very little mm -hmm. of their life had changed. Saddam hated them, but in some ways they were left to, to live their lives. So what happened in the fall of, um, in the subsequent, subsequent fall of Mosul was that ISIS then drove the Yazidis um, to the mountains and, and the Christians. Mosul had a, a substantial Christian population before the war. Um, and the, the choice for Christians basically now is you pay the tax, which most of them cannot afford to pay because it's, it's much more than they, than they make in a year. Um, and you can stay if you convert to Islam, or you're driven out. And in a sense, it is a way of ethnic cleansing, that horrible phrase that I hate, um, but is very provocative and, and expressive. Um, they, so in a sense, they're being driven out of their this ancient land that, that is theirs. And Charlie's piece touches a lot on this as well with the Armenians. Um, so the whole ethnic makeup of Iraq. Um, 
which we know is an artificial country anyway in the same sense that the former Yugoslavia was, that was drawn as a map, as a post-colonial map. But the disintegration of it mm -hmm. um, is just heartbreaking to, to watch and, and, of course, heartbreaking for my friends. I want to see if there's any questions now before we turn to Charles. For Anybody have any questions for Janine? You'll get an opportunity to ask questions later on as well. Yes. Well, thank you for reading that, Janine. For <coughs> myself and maybe for others in the room, it was very resonant. Um, I'm Hadani Titmars. I wrote a book on Iraq, Dancing in the No-Fly Zone, which is about before and after. Um, so I, too, have those notebooks with names and phone numbers. Um, it was very moving what you read, but one thing that struck me was you know, we didn't have technology before. We didn't have the internet. We, mm. Those of us were there pre-regime yep. change. We were cut off from the world. I found a lot of old friends and minders and, you know, interview subjects via Facebook. Like, yes. now my old minders want to friend yeah. me on Facebook, which is kind of odd. <laughs> but um, does it make any difference now that the world knows what's going on, that there is this uh, very close proximity to the tragedies that are happening. I mean, uh, Karim Wasfi, the cellist of Baghdad, you know, who's oh, got a, I have two chapters about him in my book. He was playing in bombed out ruins, you know, 10, 15 years ago, but it wasn't mediatique, you know? Now he had someone film him play just a few days ago on the ruins of a, a car bomb, you know, and it went everywhere. But is it really going to make a difference to this endless war, to this cycle that you talk about? No, because I think that despite 24-hour news and the way that news has evolved from, you know, when Charlie worked for ABC and you could do how, how many minute reports did you get then? There were six, seven minutes. I mean, you could be... Very rare. Really? So two, at least two, to, two to three. Two to three. But now TV reporters are basically chained to their satellite dish and have to do constant um, news. And I think what it's created is compassion fatigue. I mean, people really don't, uh, even myself, you know, I have to follow this stuff. And sometimes I wake up and I just, I'm so bombarded with it, all of the newsletters coming out of Syria, Iraq, mm. Turkey. Um, I worked for UNHCR last year. And, you, you know, after a while, mm. the endless horror stories, Homeric-type odyssey that people endure, you, yeah. you, you have to switch off, otherwise you, you begin to go mad. And I remember I coined that phrase, it wasn't Malcolm McLaren, but it was during the Rwanda genocide mm -hmm. that it was first touted that people started saying, you know, that people turned off their TV sets. So will it make a difference in, in terms of policy? There's, you know, Samantha Power and Obama and, you know, can no longer say they weren't aware, because of course they're aware. Um, but I think they were aware. Well, I mean, I think people knew what was going on in, during the Saddam regime. Mm. Um, there was certainly intelligence going back and forth. Um, so I don't think you can ever really say, no, I think that's a really lame excuse. I'm going to move yes. on to Charles now. Um, would you like to read from your sure. I may need my spectacles. You can borrow mine. Mine. Yours are probably not sufficiently strong for, <laughs> for me. Okay. Gero Manjikian. Sorry, I'm sorry. Okay. Gero Manjikian is a strongly built farmer with a degree in chemistry and a flourishing mustache like those in sepia photographs of Armenian gentlemen from the late Ottoman era. On the evening of 20th of March last year, he was having dinner at George's restaurant in the woods where Syria's Mediterranean shore adjoins Turkey's. At his restaurant table, he told me, were five of his friends and their families. Their discussion turned to the conflict entering its fourth year to unseat Syrian President Bashar al-Assad. Manjikian recalled, the mayor of Kassab was with us. We asked him about the situation, but he was very quiet. Kassab is the only Armenian town in Syria, although other Syrian villages and cities have Armenian minorities. Perched on a hillside within sight of the Turkish frontier, its 2,000 plus inhabitants also include 100 Alawite Muslims and Arab Christians. In the summer, tens of thousands of tourists used to fill its hotels and guest houses to bursting. 
The beaches, pine forests, and fruit orchards hosted camps for Armenian Boy Scouts, as well as hikers, picnickers, and Saudis seeking respite from the stifling desert heat of their country. In addition to the three churches for the Armenian Orthodox, Catholic, and Protestant congregations, a large modern mosque occupied a prominent position. Conflict was killing tourism in Kassab. Incomes were down, hotels empty. Visits to Aleppo, with its large Armenian population, became impossible after rebels occupied parts of the city in July 2012. Yet until now, the conflict had left the region relatively unscathed. The greatest calamity to hit the town in 2013, apart from the decline in tourism, was not the war between al-Assad's supporters and opponents, but unseasonal hailstorms that destroyed the peach and apple crops. However, events in Syria, else in other parts of Syria, were conspiring to engulf Kassab. On the 16th of March 2014, the Syrian army with its Hezbollah allies expelled opposition forces from the town of Yabrud near the Lebanese border. This cut the opposition's supply lines from Lebanon and left the government dominant in most of western Syria. When the rebel leadership organized a response to threaten the regime's coastal bastion of Latakia, their line of march led directly through Kassab. Throughout March, one portent after another had made the Armenians of northwest Syria apprehensive. First, smugglers tipped off inhabitants that militant jihadists were gathering nearby in parts of southwest Turkey that had not seen them before. Then, Syrian farmers living beside the international frontier noticed gunmen mustering on the Turkish side. By the 18th of March, regular Turkish army units were disappearing from the forts that guarded the 25-mile border between Turkish Hatay and Syrian Kassab. Bearded par paramilitaries and assorted non-Turkish uniforms were replacing them. A United Nations source confirmed what Manjikian had told me. Large soldiers and minivans were going up the mountain, he said. A Turkish army convoy was coming down. The UN and the Syrian military received reports on the 19th of March that guerrillas in Turkey were moving dangerously close to Kassab. It seemed that the Turkish army was relinquishing control of the border to ragged units of the Syrian opposition, although no one in Syria knew why. On the 20th of March, while Gera Manjikian and Kassab's mayor Vazgan Chaparian discussed politics over si spicy sujuk sausages and Syrian wine, a fellow Armenian from Kassab telephoned the Syrian army's central command 30 miles to the south in Latakia. He relayed widespread rebel infiltration from Turkey. The commander dismissed the man's worries on the grounds that an old agreement making the Turkish army responsible for security north and east of Kassab was still in force. The Armenians were not reassured. At 4 o'clock the next morning, the 21st of March, residents of the village of Gozetlikçer, I mean, I'm not very good with Turkish words, I'll try again, Gozlekçiler in Turkey observed paramilitary units driving through border checkpoints towards Kassab. They later told the economist veteran Turkey correspondent Amberin Zaman that the Turkish military had evacuated civilians from Gozak Çiller and prohibited journalists from entering the area. A half hour later in Kassab, an artillery bombardment woke the Catholic pastor of St. Michael the Archangel Church, Father Narek Luisian. The 43-year-old priest later told me, the sounds became louder. The Turkish army attacked our village. Everybody felt it was a dangerous situation. We ran away. At the beginning, we thought it would be for some hours, and then it will finish. Residents of Sakra, one of a dozen scattered hamlets and villages near Kassab, watched guerrilla fighters massing over the border in Turkey. They summoned Syrian border police. A United Nations official told me, the rebels shot at them at 5.30 in the morning. The Syrian border police shot back. Minutes later, assisted by mortar fire from Turkey, other rebels assaulted the Syrian police post at Komme. The battle for Kassab had begun. Garam and Jikian woke as usual at 5.30 in the morning to start work in his family's apple orchards between Kassab and Sakra. Manjikian told me when we met in Kassab six months later, I heard voices from the Syrian police station. Then I heard guns. Then after half an hour, explosions, and then missiles. At 6.30, I saw with my own eyes the Sakra police station. By then, he recalled, it had, the police station had become a column of fire. And mother, as he struggled to move his mother, who was dying of cancer, the telephone rang. An Arab Christian woman from Sakra begged Manjikian for help. She worked at Latakia's university, where his children had studied. He drove to her house beside the border to rescue her, with her mother and her son. Two mortars barely missed them, and he made it back home. 
both families, including Manjikian's three children, crammed into his light pickup truck. He said, there was not time to take my documents or my diploma. A barrage of mortar fire hastened the departure. It was nine o'clock when they reached the village of Nabain, about five miles to the south. This is another quote from Manjikian. When we saw the mortars hit Nabain, I knew this was going to be longer than we imagined. Manjikian and his family fled again, this time all the way down to the coast at Latakia. That evening, Syrian television broadcast the arrival of most of Kassab's inhabitants at St. Mary's Armenian Orthodox Church in Latakia. Many of the 2,000 men, women, and children who fled Kassab crowded into the nave, the adjoining school, and the church hall. Some had not had time to put on their day clothes, and most lacked basic provisions. In Damascus, the Armenian scholar Dr. Nora Arisian her compatriots on television. She said, I saw them in their pajamas, and it was 1915 again. Yeah. Thank you. It's beautifully read. Thank you so much. Have you um, followed what happened in Kassab since you wrote this piece? Well, what, I what, happened? what is happening there now? None of the people have returned. Mm. Uh, almost, the, 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 the village was, was occupied for a little over a month. Um, when the Syrian army reconquered the area and the, and the Islamists left, they left a lot of destruction. The people came back to rebuild the, the town. Uh, about 20% are still too afraid to come back. And now I'm told there are fears because um, the Syrian army has lost to the Nusra Front, who were involved in this assault have lost Jishr al-Sagur and Idlib, and which are important areas in western Syria. And there are people, are, some people are leaving Kassab again because they're, they're afraid that there may be an on the village. And where will they then go? They'll go to Latakia, which is the, the closest safe place for them to be. Mm. And then many will apply to visa, for visas outside and, and, and emigrate. Mm. I wanted to, um, I know this is a little bit more reading, but I wanted to just ask Charles, to read some of the graffiti that people came back to when they came back to Kassab. Um, they found widespread destruction and Islamist graffiti in Arabic. Um, I was just wondering if you could just remind okay. us of the kind of tone of this. Well, during the time that the Nusra Front and the Islamic Front were, were in Kassab, they didn't destroy the town. They did a lot of damage, and they looted it, and they just des they destroyed every single piano. There were a lot of pianos. The Armenians, as, as there may be some Armenians in this room, as you know, that they're highly cultured people, and they they had 27 piano students in a village of under 2,000 people. But every single piano was destroyed. All all the artifacts in the church were either looted or burned, and so the the th the three pastors of the Catholic and Orthodox and Protestant churches took me on a tour of their churches, and in the Protestant church, uh, the jihadists left these bits, the, actually many more, but only four of them, uh, bits of graffiti on the walls of the church. One, soldiers of the one and only God were here. God willing, we will crush the Christians, the followers. We will go after you wherever you go. Do not rejoice, O Christians, we will step on you. And finally, it is a matter of time before we get rid of you, you worshippers of the cross. I mean, it's no wonder that people were afraid. And well, also, I think what you write so beautifully, what you describe so beautifully in the piece is, is really the context of the Armenian genocide, how everything that happens reminds people of the original genocide. Well, particularly, well, particularly because of the, the Turkish participation yeah. in the assault, the Turks opening up the border, bringing the, bringing the jihadists down in trucks to the border, sending them in, giving them mortar support. To them, the perception was that the Turks are after us again. The, the, uh, Kassab had been evacuated in 1915, and many of its people were killed on the death march to, to Deir ez -Zor. Um, Kassab was also the victim of a huge pogrom by the Turks in 1909. So there's, there's a historic memory. But they always went back, and they're still going back. Mm. They, they refused mm. to let it go. The oldest Armenian church in Syria, which is a 10th century church, is, mm. is in that region. Mm -hmm. And they don't want to abandon it because they're feeling it's abandoning their heritage. Uh, heritage. Another aspect of this for the Armenians in Syria is that they feel living in, in a Muslim country, they are able to be more Christian than if they go to the West and are assimilated in, in, 
in Western Christian culture or Western secular culture. They feel that they can be more Armenian um, living amongst the Muslims in Syria. Mm -hmm. And because, in, because many of those refugees from Southeast Turkey were the, were the real ethnic cleansing took place between 1915 and 1918, ended up in Syria and were, mm -hmm. and were, were taken in and welcomed and are the Armenian, the bulk of the Armenians today are the, those survivors of that genocide. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And they have strong ties to Syria. They don't want to leave Syria, but now obviously many are because it's, particularly from Aleppo, it's, mm -hmm. not, it's not safe for them. All, all the Armenians mm -hmm. and all the other minorities feel mm -hmm. threatened by the jihadists, mm -hmm. just as many Sunnis feel threatened by the Alawite regime. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And of course, so many people are leave, leaving, I mean, Armenia is leaving Armenia itself. I mean, the population of sh Armenia itself is shrinking. And, and our Armenia has invited Syrians to come, Syrian yeah. Armenians to come yeah. to Armenia, but not many have taken it up. No. Why is that, do you think? Um, <coughs> culturally, they're very different. Mm. Uh, I mean, the, 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 the Armenians of Syria will tell you, we're Syrian. Mm -hmm. They eat Syrian food, mm -hmm. Armenian cooked in the Armenian way, but it's Syrian food. Mm -hmm. And they, uh, the, the Armenians of, of, of what that state called Armenia, that was a Soviet Republic for so long, mm -hmm. just have a completely different outlook on it. And they speak Ar the Armenian in a different way. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Do we have any questions for Charles? Yes. Yes, you can. Let's have this question first. Um, well, I guess it's a question for both, but Charles can answer it. Um, I thought your, both of your pieces were um, incredibly tightly written. And I thought the, the we conversation... Had good, we, had, we had good editing. Excellent. Um, I thought the I mean, conversation tonight was really about sort of the, the distance between reality. And I think both of you really did engage with the first draft of history. It was, it's, I mean, I, I think that with the self-confidence of thinking, yeah, I, I totally accept that what you say is true. Um, I guess the question is, is about, you talk about the endless cycle of war and, and maybe trying to write something about the, the never-ending war. How do we, as writers, as journalists, try and make something bigger than the immediacy? How do we live beyond that? And I was wondering if you felt that maybe there's room in both of your writing. And I think, Janine, you did have this with the sort of comment about the palm trees and trying to contextualize the landscape. Um, is there something, is, what, what are your thoughts about being more lyrical in your writing? Um, an Unexpected Light by Jason Elliott, for instance, is a, an unbelievably beautiful book, but it also is a very powerful bit of journalism. Um, and I think your particular writing, Charles, is, is absolutely assured but do you think it will um, live in 30 years' time as a work of literature, or is that not what you're seeking? To tell you, I've never thought about it. I mean, I really, I mean, it's, I don't know. Uh, I, I suspect it'll be, I mean, because I, most of my work now is in history. I mean, I, I write books about World War II. And so I go to archives and I look at old newspapers and everything in that period in the early, early mid-40s. Um, so I, I suppose scholars who will be wondering what happened in Syria in, at that time, and particularly if they have an interest in Kassab or in the Armenians, they, they might just come across a dusty copy of Grante at the London Library <laughs> and, and lift a couple of quotes from the piece. I hope so. I mean, I, when, I, when I wrote my first travel book, which was called Tribes with Flags, which is about greater Syria in 1987, 88, I, I really was thinking I would like, and maybe I did think about these things you've mentioned, I, don't, I hadn't thought about it before. Um, I thought, I really hope people will, will pick this up in 100 years. One of my favorite travel books about recent book called Eothen by Alexander Kinglake. And I was thinking, well, I hope somebody finds my book in a century or so, and, like I found Kinglake, and maybe go do that trip and see how things have changed and see how things might, and the little things that might be the same. Yeah, so in a way, yes. Janine, you had a question for Charles. Yes, I, I, I just wanted to say mm -hmm. to you, um, I think we have that great privilege of writing Ponta. When I write for Newsweek, I can't, of course. And, and that for me is much, for me personally, is much, much harder because I didn't set out to be a journalist, actually. I, I was an academic and then I became a journalist by default. And um, I think that for me, writing in a, a lyrical way is, is just, uh, in terms of narrative and characterization, is. I was just going to comment on it as well, if, 
if I could. No, of course. Yeah. Yeah. I was just going to say, you know, I, I read a lot of human rights reports, um, and I have to say, you know, these kinds of pieces, this kind of language, to me, it's it's, it's so important because these this is the only kind of writing that endure and I hope so. uh, <laughs> have a life after. And I think most of the world of human rights badly written, which means that people, this resistance to engagement with it, part of the compassion fatigue that you were talking about, I think comes through the medium in which we read about it. And when you go through UN reports, I mean, and for those of us that have to do that, they're so badly written that, you know, to get to the meat of the matter, um, I had to go through something the other day about Central African Republic, and it was, I needed to get this crucial <laughs> bit of information that was buried within, you know, because lawyers write it. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I think this is also, a, the human rights angle is very important because without sounding arrogant, I mean, what <coughs> I do try to do is documentation mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. as a human rights uh, writer. Mm -hmm. But um, my question was about Malula, um, which is this uh, town not far from Damascus on the road to Homs, which is a, um, was a Christian town that was overrun by Mosul uh, by ISIS last year. No, by, by Nusra. By Nusra. And then some I uh, ISIS came in as well, and there was a fight. And But they, some some people have begun to come back. But do you think that um, because the Christians and the Armenians traditionally, out of protectionism, align themselves with Assad, are getting more um, targeted? And that was the sense of the, the Yazidis and the Christians in Mosul, all, because they have all, a traditional... All, all non-Sunnis are targeted by jihadists on ideological grounds. But Christians and Armenians oh, particularly... No, 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 always much more. In the first two years of the war, the Christians were, quote, in the middle, but they weren't really victimized. No, right? I, of course, always, uh, but the, I mean, the, 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 the Alawis the and minorities. the Ismaili, no, but the, the dissident Shia sect, because there, there are very, very few mainstream Shia in, in Syria, but the dissident Shia sects, the Ismailis and the, the uh, Alawis, were, were deliberately targeted and massacred wherever, wherever their village fell to Islamists. Uh, Christians are now suffering the same fate. The Yazidis, whenever they could get their hands on them, of course, because they are seen as idolaters. Um, and, and then also Sunnis, who themselves do not subscribe yeah. to this Salafist Wahhabi view of Islam, are themselves yes. Uh, targeted as well. So, this, and this is ideological, not military. There's a kind of slight sense in the piece that Assad is protecting the Armenians. Is that a kind of undertone of the piece a little bit? And I was wondering about, I mean, following on from your question. The you Armenians know. feel now that um, they have nowhere else to go but to the regime. Yes. They weren't particular beneficiaries of the regime. In mm. fact, the mm. There weren't many beneficiaries of this regime outside the immediate entourage sure. of the president. The, the, but now, he, if you talk to the Druze, at the beginning, some Druze were very anti-Assad. Mm. Some just said, so let's just stay out of it. Well, now, because the jihadists also think the Druze should be killed because they're not good Muslims, um, they are all forced into the arms of the regime. And many, and ma many people I know who were most active in civil society demonstrations against Assad at the beginning mm -hmm. now hate what's happened to the revolution because they're stuck mm -hmm. with, the, with the umbrella of the regime keeping them alive. Mm -hmm. Do you have a <coughs> prediction for what will happen? Sorry. Well, the way it seems to be is that because uh, the regime was making so many gains in Western Syria, it, it, it gave the appearance that it was winning just as the, the, the opposition at the early stages, because they took so much and there were defections from the army, so it looked like they were winning. Now the regime is losing some territory. I, I, I suspect, because neither side has the, the force to defeat the other, mm -hmm. that the war will simply seesaw and go on and on, mm -hmm. which, is, which, which is disastrous for the country. And diplomacy's failing. It's diplomacy has hasn't failed. really been tried. I, I do think, I and mean, that's a whole other issue, but I do think um, not coffee and I think Brahimi did try. I think well, he, he did. Destroyed. No, but, but when I say it hasn't been tried, without the backing of the Russians and the Americans, mm -hmm. nothing was going to happen. When they went to Geneva, they didn't have the support of the Russians and Americans for an agreement that they could have compelled people to sign. Without the Russians and the Americans agreeing, there was no diplomatic effort. Well, Brahimi worked very hard, but he was working against the people who supposedly, that he supposedly represented. But ultimately, I think they have to bring in, maybe we should have, Iran yes. is a big factor in it. 
I was going to, um, before I open it up again, I was going to ask you both this question um, that anthropologists struggle with so much. I'm an anthropologist originally, which is the question of uh, legitimacy. You know, you go to a country, you study them. To some degree, you objectify them by writing about them. I have to say, listening to both of you up here on the stage, I'm so impressed by your very detailed knowledge of events and uh, you know, the political landscape. But did you ever, and I want to ask both of you this question, did you ever worry about, uh, you know, that, that Western self-accusation we live with? You know, what right do we have to go oh. and write, objectify, so on? M mainly when I worked in Africa. In so Africa that was a place where I constantly felt, um, it, I, I felt very intrusive. Um, Why? I because as hard as I could try, I can't blend in. I mean, I could, you know, I, I, I can blend in, in to an extent or, or in Iraq, um, or even the Balkans, where, where I worked for many years, where we both worked for many years. But um, I just felt, and I, I lived in Africa, and I, I worked in Africa for, for a decade, almost a decade, and I just felt, I always felt, and I always had this tremendous guilt as well, that I was a a white chick, you know, working working in Africa, and I can never quite comprehend it. And I, an African journalist would confront me with this often, mm -hmm. you know, and say, "Why? How can you come here and work on our country? You really, you know, you don't know it. You don't. You'll never understand what it's like to be mm -hmm. African." Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, does your question also include about authenticity in terms of you know being the people that we talk to? If we ever trust, because I, I have had an experience in mm -hmm. Iraq where I was really taken in by a professor during the Saddam time who I thought was my friend and I trusted him right. with all my heart and mm. we were best friends and I, I, I even had a place in his house I was going to go to and hide when zero hour came and mm -hmm. many years later I found out that he was actually spying on me the whole time and everything he told me was a lie. And I think that was really the first time that happened to me that as, as a reporter I realized that someone had not just lied but it, a, a parallel fantasy life, and so I mean that is mm -hmm. something that reporters, I think, um, doing this kind of work, have to constantly mm -hmm. pull into your um, into context. What about you, Charles? Um, I don't really think in those terms. You, don't, don't, you, don't, don't, you, <laughs> you don't worry about. Well, no, I mean, I, it's my life is yes, writing yes, about things, yes, is writing about yes, people. Yes. Uh, yes. So I don't, yeah. I'm not really worried that. I'm exploiting them. I mean, mm. in a way, when someone's telling me, as you say, with someone who lied to you, they are having a chance to exploit me as well. Mm -hmm. And also, I, I, I think I like to meet Arab journalists who come and cover the West, because mm -hmm. they have real insights about mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. where they're working that native <laughs> reporters don't. Yes. And I, yes. And, I, and I appreciate that, and I love, and I love also <laughs> old travel writing of those Muslim scholars mm -hmm. who traveled in the yes, West, yes. and Haji Baba, and yes. others, who came and wrote about the French court mm -hmm. in the way they saw it, which mm -hmm. is not the way Frenchmen see it. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I think, I think we, 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 we need to look at each other and write about each other. And yeah, I'm, I'm, sure, I'm sure most people in Syria would think, the way I write about Syria, that I'm completely nuts. Mm -hmm. that I'm, you know, that I'm, it doesn't, it's not the way they see it. Mm -hmm. I think it's fair okay. enough. Okay. But I, 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 st I still think it's worth doing because I'm curious about the world and, and, and to be curious about the world requires then I've got to do something with that curiosity and that means that I have to articulate it. I mean, I have to, I have to put it on paper. I don't really, when I go to c cover something, I don't know what I'm going to say until I've written it. That's how I organize my yeah. thoughts is on yeah. paper. I really agree with what you're saying, you know, but it's nice to have it restated because there is, of course, uh, a school of thought that says, you know, who are we? Well, no, but I mean, look, the, certain people who say went to Iraq in 2002, early 2003, mm -hmm. simply to say there were weapons of mass destruction here who were doing, who were doing propaganda for the government, basically, mm -hmm. well, that's exploitative and lying and wrong, and mm -hmm. it's, it, it's, it's very bad for our profession that, uh, that some of our colleagues do this, mm -hmm. but it, it, that does happen, and that obviously is, is not acceptable. Any other questions? Yes. Thank you for wonderful uh, presentations, and I'm 
looking forward to reading uh, their articles. My father is from Kesab. My father was born in Kesab. He's not, uh, he passed away 20 years ago. I was born in Lebanon, but I've been, uh, since the civil war in Lebanon, I've been in uh, Syrian countries. And to a point, maybe, to give you an idea, I hold four passports. I'm a citizen of four countries, not by choice, but by uh, necessity. My question is because both of you addressed this issue uh, of the context, the historical context. In the case of the Armenians, 100 years later, uh, what happened to the Armenians is happening again to Christians and Yazidis and Shias, or same, similar massacres, I mean mass atrocities are taking place. And 100 years later, still Samantha Power and Obama and the British government, they still uh, working with, uh, dealing with the semantics of what do we call it, uh, is it the genocide? So uh, my question is, how do you frame the current, what's going on currently in terms of the divide between the politics of it, the dipl diplomatic uh, interest and so on, and what's going on with the lives of people on the ground. There seems to be a lot of reporting, a lot of uh, information and uh, with the social networks and so on, and how does this filter into policy making and making a difference? You know, for my great sins this year, out of exactly what you're saying, huge frustration grappling with this for the past 25 years, I started a, degree, a master's degree in international law. Because I, um, I think in some sense there's a limit to what journalism can do. We can bring awareness, we can tell the story. Um, occasionally, I mean, I remember probably the cracking point for me was Srebrenica when those of us kept reporting on it and reporting on it from 92, 93, 94, and nothing happened. And a genocide did happen in 1995 that could have been prevented. And it was then that I began to realize that the gap between reporting and bearing witness, as you know, many people call it, and policy making and policy makers is huge. And they might call us in occasionally and, and ask for our advice. Or I, I went to see a very high-ranking <coughs> negotiator the other day involved in Syria. And he looked at me. They, it makes you realize that they don't really know what's going on on the ground. I mean, they're having meetings now in Geneva behind closed doors with ambassadors from Iran and China. And, but they're not actually talking <laughs> to the guys that matter on the ground. They don't have representatives from Nusra or from ISIS. They can't, they're terrorist organizations, but still they don't have people from inside, from the LCCs in Syria. So there's an enormous gap between what is um, happening in the Security Council <laughs> and what's happening um, and in Obama's office and, and, um, and what's actually happening on the ground. And that's hugely frustrating for me personally, anyway. I'll leave it with you. <laughs> Any other questions? Yes. Down there. And then you, yeah, just picking up on that, um, about the diplomacy surrounding the um, attack on um, the Armenian town, uh, Charlie, I just wondered, um, given that the uh, British government and the American government, unlike the European Union, um, uh, as you say, balk at calling um, the, the massacre of um, Armenians in t to, uh, 1915 uh, a genocide. What, what has been the diplomatic reaction to this particular incident that you described by either the State Department or the British Foreign Office? As it, as it happened, it was, a, it was a diplomatic move that led to the Islamist evacuation of Qasab. Uh, the Armenian lobby in America went full throttle to bring the American attention to this. They, they got a large group of congressmen to write letters in protest to Obama. They were giving press conferences. However, they did lie. They, they said there were huge massacres in Kassab. As, as you know, there, there were hashtags, Armenia, save Kassab, yeah. the thousands of Armenians Kim had Kardashian. been massacred. In, in fact, no one was massacred in Kassab. 
but it was a terrible thing that had it been a massacre. There's no, no doubt about it. But it, it just so happened there wasn't. But on the, the fiction that there was a massacre, uh, the, the US leaned on the Turks to withdraw logistical support for the jihadists in the Kassab area. Therefore, the Syrian army could come back in, and they, and they left. That's, so in a way, it was a diplomatic settlement based on a lie. A useful lie. Yeah. <laughs> I think there was a question here. <laughs> yes, go ahead. We started out earlier, and you were talking about the poetry of both your readings, which I agree, it's exquisite and the difference of your reading, for writing for Newsweek versus Grantis. And it seems to me when you have subjects like peace, which I think is the most important priority we as a civilization have today than any other time, perhaps because of the global reach. If the bomb goes off a thousand miles away, you know it instantaneously because of social media and a whole host of other things. That I think it's a tool in terms of how do we make the idea of peace, how do we bring it to the public with the poetry that perhaps they become more proactive in how they can be engaged to create the platform to build a nation and a world filled with peace rather than, than hate. If we're just going to be talking about sensational journalism and the bomb goes off and arms are frailing and, and, you know, and I'm a photojournalist so I, I'm doing the visual implication. You try to make something that's a bit more poetic and it doesn't have the impact. And I think Grantus has a much more limited audience of who buys it and so on, what the <coughs> circulation is, versus a broad audience. Do you have a view of how we can bring the poetry to the wider world so that they can embrace the ideas? I'll have to leave that to you. I mean, I think everything comes down to education. And we know that you know, going back to Bosnia, it has, it's been 25 years, you know, and, and yet the generations, we knew it would take generation and generation for the, the concept of peace, if that's what it even is, an uneasy peace, to relax into it. When I look now at Syria and Iraq, um, my heart breaks because I think that this is, you know, we're talking about four, five generations, and even then, then the whole cycle of, of war will start up again. Um, I don't know, in, in a kind of esoteric sense, how you bring <laughs> peace to the public. Um, I did mention that part um, in right before the invasion, when all the do-gooders came <laughs> into into Baghdad. And you know, it's easy for us to mock them. There were all kinds of hippies that drove <laughs> in busloads, um, but they genuinely believed in what they were doing. And these people are important. I mean, the whole grassroots movement and. Social, I mean, I was looking at the Nepal, um, someone started, I don't even know what crowd surfing is, and, but um, crowd surfing to raise money for Nepal for the humanitarian efforts. And um, this is social capital. You know, this is, this is when people do bond together. In that way, the internet that we didn't have in the Saddam days um, is incredibly useful for this, for spreading information very quickly um, in an educational sense and an and, and enlightening sense, I suppose. I don't know if that really answers it, but I tried. <laughs> I also think a, a part of the peace movement has gone into the transitional justice movement, yes, absolutely. You know, which is a slightly different thing, yeah. with, with, you know, that came out of Chile and South Africa, the yeah. Truth Commission, and, and you know, that, that has thoughts about how do you rebuild a country after humanitarian catastrophes of whatever kind. You know, and there's a lot of psychoanalytic thought that comes into that about reparative justice, which is quite interesting, I think. I think there was a question over there. Yes. I uh, just echo, in a, in a sense, what the, what the lady just mentioned earlier. Yeah. What, what struck me about, about about the readings, both of them really, was the um, uh, uh, sort of um, the element of travel writing. Mm -hmm. That, that came into it when you were talking about driving through the dusty, dusty villages and all the rest of it. You know, as though there was sort of tumbleweed rolling through the towns. You know, if, if a travel writer, you know, had written a, had written uh, about Iraq or or Armenia, then people would perceive it in a different way. They wouldn't see it as as war journalism. They would see it as beautiful travel writing, and and, and maybe that maybe that 
in a sense, takes away the uh, compassion fatigue mm. because they're not reading about the war. They're reading ab about the about the about the place, mm. you know, and the people. And, and then when the, uh, maybe that that's the, the empathy can mm. then be built with, mm. with the people because they view it not as war war writing or war reporting, but, but as travel writing. Uh, what what struck me was w when you mentioned. About the, um, I think I was in Syria. The, the, the worst thing that the worst thing that had happened was the hailstones had damaged the crops, <laughs> and, and to me that human that that, that, that humanised it because I can imagine a farmer whose crops been ruined. He's thinking like, shit, how am I going to feed the kids? Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, so that so you know he's more concerned about a bot. He's more concerned about the weather than he is about a bomb. You know. Uh, well, this is, but both the, both of these are travel pieces. Yeah, yeah sure, sure, yeah. sure. And, 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 and so what I'm saying is that that, that, that you know, m maybe if there's more of that in the mainstream press, like Newsweek or whatever, then that removes the compassion fatigue element of it because people are reading about the people and the places. We have to remember that these pieces, travel pieces, generally are long. Sure, newspapers, sure. Newspapers, for the most part, don't have space. I mean, Jonathan Chainin, the Guardian, is one of the few who gives a lot of space to this kind of writing in a newspaper. Yeah, sure. But otherwise, it's Granta, it's the New Yorker, it's the New York Review of Books, London Review of Books, very, you know, very few outlets. I mean, I'm glad these, thank God these things exist, yeah. but it's very, very hard to make a living but doing I, that. I completely mm -hmm. agree with you, and I, I just find that the only way to, to write about war, or the only way I could ever write about war was, I don't, I mean, there are my mates really like to hang out with soldiers and get into the down and dirty about what guns they're using, but for me, it was oh, it always came down to the people. It always came down to sitting on the floor, drinking tea for hours and talking about their lives and how they raised their kids, and and then you could weave in the humanitarian disaster. You could get the political um, involvement in it. You could bring in the diplomacy. But the the only way I can write, um, it, I, first of all, I have to be passionate about it. Um, I kept my editors kept wanting me to go to the Ukraine this year, and I just. Couldn't I don't know I mean I just it, it, my my heart right now is in Syria and Iraq I'm I've also written a book about Syria um, which will come out later than Charlie's but I can't um, I can't write about something unless I feel it and I can't feel it unless I spend time with people I'll, and a lot of time and that's a great luxury and yes Jonathan and Sigrid and people like that give us that chance to to do that. But there is one thing I want to say. I mean, all my friends kind of moan that the demise of journalism, it's gone, it's no more, you can't. But it's, I don't think it's true. I think it mm -hmm. is coming back. I mm -hmm. really do. I think people want to read longer pieces. They don't want to get a short shock hit of whatever those websites are that, you know, give you fascinating. Mm -hmm. I, I don't, mm -hmm. you know, I don't want to read the Huffington Post. I really don't. Mm -hmm. um, pick on one or, or BuzzFeed or... I don't even know what BuzzFeed is or Vice or no, sir. I well, want Vice to has read some long pieces, actually. <laughs> I want to read an eight thousand word piece in in Granter, the Guardian. Thank you very much. <laughs> thank you. Well, thank you. Are there any other any last questions? Yes, go ahead. Thank you. Um, uh, I have a question uh, linked to the mention of um, poetry, actually in uh, this evening and, and um, there's there seems to be um, a sense that writing poetically or lyrically um, is um, appropriately articulate in a way that you know reportage or or writing news wires or um, human rights documentation is, is less so um, I mean this is probably a pointless question right you're not poets and you don't write poetry but I just wonder whether um, in general you feel there is a reason why still writing in prose, albeit poetically, is um, better, is still um, more fitting than actually writing poetry um, and using poetry as a tool for interrogating um, and making something of the same material. There are some very good poets who do that. I mean, Tom Pollan, James Fenton, Fenton who was also a journalist, um, engages very strongly with, with political issues in his poetry. That's what those they do, those are, but we're not poets, I mean, so how can, how can we do it? But I, I, I love James and Tom both. I think their poetry is fantastic. Tom, Tom on Palestine is absolutely more powerful than anything any journalist has written. I, 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 you get novelists who write about war then, which is not as good as their novels, like Steinbeck. Um, so sometimes it can go the other way as well. 
I want to mention we have, uh, I don't know if you're familiar with a, a Russian-Estonian poet, Jan Kaplinsky. We've got some of his poems in the autumn issue of Randa, which is about the natural world, and um, they're being translated at the moment. I'm very excited about that. Yes, one last question over there. I've covered a lot of, for 40 years of, uh, as a producer, journalist, I've covered all the conflicts in the world, so I know. One thing I find is this idea of regime changes and the mistake that the liberal, so-called leftists make is immediately supporting any opposition that comes up to any oh. regime that has committed some, or not, if not some human, but without even questioning what this opposition yeah. is about, immediately rushing in for support. Yeah. Uh, have we not learned anything? Very Can French, I answer right? that question? Yeah. No. <laughs> <laughs> Are you, you talking about that? Bernard Henri Levy by any chance? <laughs> um, no, I mean, I think it is an automatic reaction for people to <laughs> the underdog in one way or another. And the left will continuously gravitate. Um, well, but then again, I mean, look at the Gaddafi, look at the Libya case. Um, all in, I live in France, and, and as does Charlie sometimes. And um, the, in Libya, the, um, bombing campaign in Libya, a lot of the French intelligentsia actually were supporting Gaddafi. So as a way that, you know, a regime change, it was not the right time for it. It was not that nation building and state building um, can be opportunistic. And again, going back to the whole colonial powers issue. So um, I don't know. I mean, but I agree with you, of course, it is going to um, especially in America, where everything is so politically correct now. And There's that whole line of that. So, so by the way, the, the support for rebellions in the Arab world that we've seen, the United States in particular supported those against regimes that it didn't like. So when the Shia in Bahrain rose up, <laughs> yes. they sent the Saudi police in to crush them. Yeah. There, was yeah. no, there was no sympathy for them. Yeah, there was no press campaign for them. There was no uh, arming of them. I'm not saying they should have been armed, but there was no there was no interference at all. They were crushed. Bashar al-Assad, who is your average Arab dictator, I mean, he, he does all the things that all the others do and tortures and kills, but that's not why they want to get rid of him. They want to get rid of him because he's an ally of Iran and Russia. And it's obvious. That's why they want him to, he, and he's a supporter of Hezbollah, whom Israel doesn't like. So that's why they want to get rid of him. And they, so they were willing to arm the devil himself. As a friend of mine in Aleppo, who's now fearful for his life, the devil himself was unleashed on Syria because, because of this alliance he had with Iran and Russia. Pure and simple, not because he's bad. They're all bad. Yeah, my, my question was not about the American support. My question was about no, the but liberals and the but left you, but you, but you, of but, Europe. But you, you find that often the two go in tandem, that the, the intellectual elite will provide justifications for the, the to do their job. I think we'd better call it uh, an end. We're a bit over time. So um, I just thank you. I just want to thank Janine and Charles very much indeed. And I want to remind you that you can buy a copy of the Granda um, over there. And you can also sign up as subscribers. Please do. You should like yes. to. And I strongly encourage you to do so. Aidan, who's sitting over there, is going to uh, be manning the table. Thank you.